Welcome all to today's Supply Chain Insights webinar series. I am your host, Constance Coral. Today's topic is Supply Chain Matters, Understanding the Link Between Supply Chain and Corporate Performance. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few details. We will be recording today's session and it will be available to view on demand. Today's webinar deck will be available shortly on SlideShare. Our agenda includes Laura Ciceri, founder and CEO of Supply Chain Insights, leading the discussion with our guest today, Philippe Lombat, Senior Vice President of Supply Chain at Merck. We also want to hear from you, so please participate and ask questions in the Q&A section. We will get to as many as possible as we go through the presentation. And today's Twitter hashtag is SCI Webinar, so please go ahead and tweet out nuggets of information in the social networks. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Laura Ciceri. Thank you so much, Constance, and it's great to see so many people online on the weekend before a long holiday here in the States. And you know, we've been working at Supply Chain Insights on metrics that matter for the last 18 months, and we're writing a book on it, and we're very excited, and I can see that the audience is as well. So what we're trying to understand is the link between supply chain and corporate performance. And I am joined today by Philippe Lombat. Uh, Philippe's having a little trouble dialing in, so we'll hear him ping in here in just a minute. But I'm going to start the presentation, and he'll join me in a little bit. I met Philippe uh, six years ago when he was managing the Kraft Supply Chain Organization. I've always had the greatest respect for Philippe and the work that he's done as a visionary in supply chain, both with creating cross-functional processes and driving end-to-end -end supply chain excellence. Um, Philippe will also be speaking at our global summit, uh, which is on September 11th. And he'll be giving a more in-depth presentation on some of the slides that he'll talk about today. But let me give you a little bit of introduction about what we're trying to do. So at Supply Chain Insights, we write independent, and we try to make it actionable and objective advice for supply chain leaders. This research is funded by us, so it's not funded by a third party. And we try to create research that allows supply chain leaders to have a more elevated and insightful discussion about supply chain leadership. The work on metrics that matter actually started with writing the book Bricks Matter, which was started about two years ago, where we looked at 30 years of supply chain leadership. And we asked ourselves the question of, what progress had we made? And we found that companies had, by and large, not reduced inventory over the last 30 years, that it was questionable that they had improved customer service, and that most companies were stuck on the intersection of operating margin and cycles. This is leading to the second book, which is going to be published by Wiley for April 2014, that will take each individual sector, will show the evolution of companies within that sector, and how they've done on what we call the effective frontier. For those who are following us, we did 18 reports in 2012 and 19 reports so far in 2013. We want to make the reports available to everyone so they're available on SlideShare and on our website. We just believe research should not be put behind a firewall. So let's start. The supply chain professional has been moving for the last 30 years like this man on this moving sidewalk. If you're on a moving sidewalk, you move faster than the person that would be standing beside you that would not be on the moving sidewalk. But where is the person going? There's been a belief that we are following best practices. But what we find is that we're really following emerging practices and that to move forward, we have to learn what happened in the past to unlearn, to relearn. And the reason is that we assumed that there was this thing called best practices, right? And that if we implemented best practices at the bottom of this chart on supply chain strategy, that we would get things right. And instead, what we find is 9 out of 10 companies are actually stuck with the inability to drive the balance between operating margin and inventory cycles because they haven't started with the design of the network at a value chain strategy level, 
to align demand relationships and align supply relationships and build the networks outside in and then be able to rationalize plat product platforms, design the response, and build organizational talent and teams. What we found in our research of studying companies is that complexity has increased and that we've been unable to absorb with most supply chain designs the level of complexity that the business are seeing, but we're asked to do more with less to improve operating margins and reduce cycles. So what we did at Supply Chain Insights was we started charting where are we on the averages. And we see that every industry group has a very different pattern and that you can't just put companies in a spreadsheet and shake them up. These are the average financial ratios across these elements of growth, profitability, cycles, and complexity for the last decade. What we also see is that the question around best in class is not so simple. That, you know, to be best in class, we've got to perform better than the peer group, and we've got to drive year-over-year -year results. And align internally on metrics with conscious choice on the trade-offs and deliver against the business strategy and demonstrate consistency in results and drive innovation in supply chain processes. And we actually find that when companies have balance, and they're good at managing the trade-offs if they're able to drive higher levels of market capitalization. Now let me just say that this sounds a lot easier than it is because what we see is that when companies try to make these trade-offs on what we call the effective frontier as shown by this diagram of balancing growth, profitability, cycles, and complexity, that today, nine out of 10 companies are stuck, that complexity has increased, and they're being asked to grow, but they're not able to really balance profitability in cycles. So one of the things that we wanted to understand is who had done it best? And so we've worked on a couple of different methodologies. One is the supply chain effective frontier, which I just showed you, which actually maps the financial ratios at the intersections over the last decade to look at which companies have been able to really improve potential to drive the improvement of growth, profitability, cycles, and complexity to maximize the supply chain strategy. The second thing is we've looked at which financial ratios for which industries correlate with market capitalization. And we're not done with that work yet. We've actually been doing it for each Morningstar sector through regression routines and cluster analysis. And what we find is that each industry is far more different than we ever thought. And, you know, it's just hubris to think that we can put them all on a spreadsheet and shake them up, that we really got to be able to look at it by peer group. And then the question of supply chain excellence is really how do companies against that supply chain strategy, which aligns to the business strategy, work to allow and maximize value through the setting of targets for these financial ratios and aligning the metrics that matter? One of the things in our observation is that we find that most companies will take singular metrics and they'll try to push a singular metric like profitability or cycles or inventory without really looking at the supply chain as a complex system and the intersection of these metrics. And so what we wanted to do was to help companies to understand how they tie together. So we started mapping at the intersection ratios like these, those that are growth, profitability, cycles, and complexity that come from financial balance sheets to really understand what is the potential of each industry sector and how well have companies done in trying to improve either market capitalization or improve performance on the effective frontier. And we call the work on market capitalization the supply chain index and the work on creating balance the effective frontier. And what we see in the work that we've done on the index so far is that the actual correlations and the equations that we have developed look very different by industry. And this gives you an example of where we are today, and we're not done, and we're still validating it. 
But look at the difference of how supply chain matters to market capitalization based upon the industry. And this is actually showing the R squared value or how well our equation correlates and the Y intercept which says what amount of progress can the supply chain actually have on market capitalization because we know that a lot of factors go into market capitalization. So the other thing we were looking at is how have we done as companies at productivity and manufacturing? And what we see is that certain industries have done quite well. The chemical industry and the consumer electronics industry have done quite well. But we see that industries like apparel have stalled or food and beverage has not been able to reach the same potential. And a lot of this is because the processes at the end of the supply chain, those dealing with the customer, those dealing with suppliers, are immature. And we have fragile ends of the supply chain in these particular value networks. The other thing we see is that there's been very little progress, if any, in retail. So while we've talked about collaboration, this particular industry segment has not been able to improve productivity. So what we tried to do was start to mine patterns and to understand the patterns between companies that are like peer groups. And so just to orient you before Philippe joins us, these are the beverage players. PEP is PepsiCo, KO is Coca-Cola, and this is at the intersection of that effective frontier really looking at inventory turns and revenue per employee. And what we find is that supply chain leaders have very tight patterns. You'll notice that on the PepsiCo pattern that there's a little bit of gyration, but there is steady progress towards improvement. Whereas the Coca-Cola swings are much wider. And these are two peer group companies and you can actually see that <coughs> Coca-Cola because of acquisitions and because of business changes has actually gone backwards in revenue per employee and was stalled for many years on being able to drive inventory turns. Very different patterns and pattern recognition. The other thing is if we look at the cereal category and we look at General Mills, which is GIS, versus Kellogg, we can see a very different pattern here too on the intersection of operating margin and revenue per employee. And what we see in this particular segment is that both companies have gone backwards in revenue per employee because of the building of the account teams and the work that has had to go on with managing retail. But we can also see that General Mills has outperformed Kellogg. And a lot of this has to do with leadership and it has to do with the maturity in planning and it has to do with maturity in horizontal processes. But Kellogg has actually not only gone backwards in revenue per employee, but has failed to achieve the progress in operating margin that General Mills has, which really gets down to supply chain matters. This is another pattern. This is consumer products, which patterns Procter & Gamble versus Colgate versus a small mid-market player called Beiersdorf. And Beiersdorf is a company that has headquarters in Germany, makes Navia cream. Of course, Colgate is a more global company, and Procter & Gamble is the largest company in household products. What we see here is that Procter & Gamble, because of scale, has outperformed in revenue per employee, but has also recently improved inventory turns. Colgate has also improved revenue per employee, but not nearly to the same degree and has not driven inventory turns. Instead, they have driven operating margin. Beiersdorf, on the other hand, has actually had an increase for three or four years in the improvement of operating inventory turns, but in the last year had a downturn. So what I want to do is sensitize you to what the patterns look like. When we look at another intersection of the same three companies on cash to cash cycle versus operating margin, you can see that Beiersdorf had a tremendous improvement in cash to cash driven by payables and that Procter & Gamble also had an improvement in cash to cash but lost ground on operating margin whereas Colgate made ground. So this is the kind of pattern recognition that we've been doing. <clears throat> 
So one of the things that we wanted to do today was to invite Philippe Lombat to talk about his background with Bristol-Myers Squibb and Merck and Kraft, and we've contrasted Kraft and Nestle to get a bird's eye view of the view from Philippe. And Constance, do we have Philippe on the phone? It sounds like that Philippe has not been able to make it yet. So I'm going to start and hopefully he'll join us. So Bristol-Myers and Smirk are very different size companies. Uh, when I talked to Philippe about this earlier, what Philippe said was if we look at operating margin, cash to cash, inventory turns, and revenue per employee, and you'll notice that pharmaceutical companies are not nearly as mature as some of these other patterns that I showed you earlier, that what we have is a very wide pattern. But the Bristol-Myers numbers actually have a tighter correlation to market capitalization than the Merck numbers. And in fact, we actually find that the Merck numbers fall below the average peer group, whereas the Bristol-Myers numbers have the highest correlation for market capitalization. So what do we see here? What we see is in Bristol-Myers numbers that we ha when we contrast cash to cash to inventory turns, we can actually see the improvement of inventory versus cash to cash. So we see that Merck started in one point, went a circular level, and then came back to approximately the same level. So this is cash to cash versus inventory turns. And then when we look at inventory turns versus revenue per employee, what we see is that Bristol-Myers Squibb actually made continuous improvement here on revenue per employee with some downturn in inventory turns in the last year, but Merck was not able to perform to the same level. And when we look at the Merck numbers on another chart, which is even wider, which is inventory turns versus operating margin, what we see is that there are fairly large swings in the Merck numbers versus the Bristol-Myers numbers. And the pharmaceutical companies have much wider swings than what we'll see in household products. So one of the things that we have done is we have started to ask supply chain leaders to give us their opinion on how do they feel about the presentation and what do they get from the analysis as we look at average performance. And you know, when I interviewed Philippe on this, and I'm sorry, it looks like Philippe's had some difficulty joining us today. Philippe said that one of the issues that he fought on Merck was changes in priorities quarter by quarter. And the belief that the company could always make up the gain and that the management of the complex system and the management of the potential was always something that they believed that they could just work harder and that they could make up. But it was always the quarter by quarter work that changed the game and that they were unable to consistently work on a consistent strategy. Now on the Kraft versus Nestle numbers, when we contrast these two players, both are global players, uh, Kraft at 54, and we know that Kraft has now split and gone to Mondelez and Kraft and Nestle at 98. What we have here are, again, a similar comparison. Now notice how much tighter the patterns are for food and beverage versus pharmaceutical. And so what we see in the Nestle numbers is that Nestle has made a tremendous improvement in cash to cash through payables, but not a lot of progress in inventory turns. Kraft has not made as much improvement in cash to cash has tried to make improvement in inventory turns, but again, Philippe is going to talk about how there was a lack of leadership and the need for a seat at the table to be able to drive these month-to-month, quarter-to-quarter, year-to-year results. So the other thing is when we look at inventory turns versus revenue per employee, what we see here 
is when we look at Kraft Foods, Kraft was actually able to improve revenue per employee but, and was able to outperform Nestle, even though there was a difference in scale. But again, Fleet doesn't feel that the company was able to get to the performance that Philippe wanted. And so one of the issues that Philippe talks about, and he will be presenting at our global summit, and I apologize that he wasn't able to make it today, is the deterioration in operating margin. As we look at this particular slide, one of the things that happened in Kraft was the deterioration of operating margin because of the lack of ability to actually manage complexity on this effective frontier of balancing growth, profitability, cycles, and complexity. That as complexity got worse, they were unable to get a seat at the table to really drive that understanding of the balance. And so what happened was Kraft, over the period of time, lost operating margin. You'll notice Nestle, in the same period of time, was able to make progress on operating margin, very similar to the Colgate pattern that I showed you before, but was not able to make improvement in inventory turns. Philippe, I see you're online. Are you able to talk yet? OK, he's almost ready. Um, and then when we look at average performance, you can see a very different pattern between these particular companies as we look at Kraft, which was not able to have the same level of performance as Nestle in some of the metrics. But you can see that Nestle had much better performance as we look at this in some areas than Kraft, and you can see the actual averages. Both companies were under the average for inventory turns, and you can see that in cash to cash, which we want short cash to cash cycles, it was actually Nestle that had the better performance because of the work on payables, and Nestle had slower year-over-year -year sales and revenue per employee. So I can see Philippe on my screen, but I can't hear him. Constance, how are we doing? OK, I think Constance must be working to get Philippe on board, so I apologize for that. I have a question that's come in. I think we'll have Philippe here in a minute. Uh, a question I'm not getting how to understand the revenue per employee versus inventory turns. There's so many factors contributing to revenue. Do you have anything else to show correlation or breakdown to turns versus contributions to revenue? Well, it's very complex, but revenue per employee actually comes off the balance sheet. It's the number, it's the revenue divided by the employees. And what we see is that revenue per employee is a measure of productivity and that the inventory turns is actually the ability to turn inventory based upon revenue. Philippe? Can you hear me? Yes, I, do. I, I can. Can you hear me, Laura? I can. Thanks for joining us. So the group is anxious to hear, Philippe. I went through the slides, but they're anxious to hear your interpretation. If we just go backwards, let's first talk about your experience at Merck. What did you learn about balancing the effective frontier on Merck and the comparison between Bristol-Myers and Merck? Well, certainly what, uh, thank you uh, for having me, Laura, again. Sorry for, I apologize for being late here. Um, so what, what's really the key difference between Merck and uh, Bristol-Meyer when you look at this is, is the fact that there was a key uh, disturbance factor in Merck in 2009 when Merck acquired Charing Plow, and that's what you see on this chart here, where in 2009 the curve, uh, you know, brutally goes um, toward the right on operating margin, and I think you had a chart before that also showed that uh, the inventory turn, yes, uh, on this one, was also going uh, toward the left. So what really occurred is uh, you had an organization which was uh, fairly large at the time, uh, about 50,000 people, uh, but was just getting around 2009 the good basics of supply chain. 
And when it merged with Sharing Plow, Sharing Plow was actually very present in emerging markets. And certainly at the end of 2011, Merck was then a, a company with 160 countries, uh, but also 90,000 employees, and a very different practice in supply chain. And uh, what really occurred was um, while the strategy was obviously the right one to merge Merck capabilities at the time, which was fairly focused on Europe and, and uh, North America, with the, the strengths of the portfolio of sharing plow in emerging market, it was, from a supply chain point of view, an enormous change. Uh, just uh, as, a, as an example, uh, Merck, before the merger, had 30 plants, about 31 plants, and after the merger ended up starting in 2011 with 90 plan. So what you had is, was a, a very big uh, high capacity and a, a much, much increased complexity because it was selling to a lot of country with a fairly limited amount of strength in, in its supply chain process. And that's where actually while the company from a financial point of view did good and, and the uh, business strategy was sound, the supply chain uh, really had to go through an enormous amount of stress with limited amount of tools and capabilities and the right expert extremely stretched with a much more complex business. And Merck is uh, progressively um, putting online capabilities and tools to do that and training people. But as you can see, it's been a big disruptive factor. Whereas BMS has actually gone the other way has been very focused because it saw a loss of patents much earlier on, has actually shared the number of, pro, uh, of uh, companies in 2009 and um, added some wanted complexity in 2012, but by and large has continued along the way of uh, simplifying its business, streamlining it, and, and uh, enhancing its processes. And that's what you see, actually. There is no silver bullet in supply chain capability. You have to stay the course. And that's the current difference that you see between BMS and Merck, uh, you know, where BMS has started much earlier that journey. So, Philippe, what would you tell people about doing that kind of merger and acquisition? Are there any kind of lessons learned that you would share? Yeah, I, I think you, you you have to understand, you know, in, in due diligence very often you obviously look for um, uh, big caring and, and, and key issues. What's very often uh, underestimated is uh, the culture and what the culture does to the processes. As an example, again, Merck is uh, or, or was a fairly centralized company, and Sharing Plow was a fairly decentralized company. As a result, the way planning end-to-end -end is and was done was radically different. There was no right or wrong. They were just different. And when you see this, when, when you assess that fairly fast, you, my advice, and I've lived it with Kraft at Cadbury, you really have to take a decision about which way you want to go. Because very often for companies, the, the worst, um, when you acquire a company or you merge with a company, the, the, the most satisfying and reassuring uh, way is basically to keep things as they are. And what I've lived through many merger uh, and acquisition, it turns out actually that's, that's the worst approach. Because that's the approach where you reinforce the fact that the way of doing things of each company is actually the good one. And when you come later on in the process of harmonizing, you have much more entrenched position and much more you know, uh, extreme discussion that drag on too fast. When Kraft acquired Cadbury, um, the advice we had, and we did that, was to go extremely fast on decision on tools, for example. We did decide that SAP was the, the, the common corporate tool, and it was going to be the version that Kraft had. Uh, after literally 90 days, uh, we, we stated where which process were going to be, and you may not have everybody on the same boat, but you have a, a clarity of purpose and direction. And so do you think that is one of the differences on the craft numbers and the progress here versus what you see in Merck is the harmonization of those processes early in the merger? Um, partially. I mean, obviously, uh, 
Cadbury came on top of a fairly large uh, um, organization. And also, by the way, Kraft, you know, whilst it's known as a, for a long time by uh, in the U.S., Kraft is effectively the result globally of an enormous amount of, of uh, acquisition in the in the 90s. So we, you know, Kraft bought about 30 different companies, and there was an experience of continuously, you know, bringing company in and sometimes selling companies, probably like uh, other company and consumer good do. Uh, Merck, when it did that, actually that was the first major business acquisition that it did. You, you know, Merck does acquire regularly molecules and, and product in earlier development phase, but the the, the, the sharing plan Merck acquisition was literally uh, in size a merger or equal. It was a forty billion dollar merger with a company that had no experience, and that is extremely disruptive. You see that in other industry like automobile industry. This is never something that helps you, you know, stay the course. And so I, I would say you have to, to, to build those muscles, and it's always a, a watch out to think that your existing organization is going to be able to run the business and at the same time perform merger when you've never done it before. So, Philippe, if we look at the slide that's up now, which contrasts Kraft versus Nestle on the ability to have maintenance of operating margin and inventory turns, what did you learn through this experience that you can tell us about the interpretation of this pattern? Well, obviously, you see, uh, you know, within Nestle and and, uh, and Kraft, you see very big difference. Um, what uh, what really you have to go under the hood of both those giant, literally Kraft and Nestle, to understand the different pieces uh, of, of geographically and product-wise. One of the things I learned uh, with usually large company on the company many of us are working with, you know, the notion of leverage or scale is critical to get better at supply chain and, and lower costs. But at the same time, what, what I've learned throughout the year is you need to do that understanding what needs to be common, but at the same time being very clear about what's different. And when you look at a uh, portfolio of, of Nestle, and you know I can give you other example, obviously when you start to think about fresh cheese, which has a 45-day shelf life all the way to the shelf, versus a biscuits that are a couple of hundred days, versus coffee that can be a couple of years, uh, versus meat that is 15 days, you really have different reactivity and different firepower. So the trick here is to be able to manage at an enterprise level and the setting specific targets for each of the products, but also keeping track on, on the price. And Nestle has been very good at balancing, investing in some area, being leaner in some others, where uh, it's been more difficult and more turbulent, as you can see with, with Kraft here. So with Kraft, you actually went backwards in operating margin. You have some gyrations and inventory turns. What's that story about? Yes. And, Did and you also – go ahead, sorry. And, and like you said, I mean, you, you used the, the, the notion of singular metrics versus, you know, complex system. The way we lived at, at, uh, at Kraft, uh, Kraft was aiming to – Basically, at the time, and you know, even as a, as a supply chain leader there, I, I, I was not aware of that. Uh, there was an enormous amount of pressure at the time on improving uh, inventory churn to actually improve cash flow to fund acquisitions. And uh, that was a very financial approach, which as Kraft grew and acquired companies, Literally, Kraft was able, despite large acquisition, to keep its, its Moody rating. And that was the key driver where the CFO sponsored a very big focus on inventory. When the, the peak that, that you saw were improvement were uh, made by making the metrics of inventory extremely present in, in everybody's uh, incentive, including the marketeers which led to a, a big swing. And, you know, we had, a, despite all the tools, obviously, that we put in place, we had a lot of focus and a lot of follow-ups on improving inventory. But at the same time, when you do that, you have to watch out to balance service with it. Uh, 
and one of the learning here is is when you do that, and we were able to purchase the whole of Cadbury for fifteen billion dollar and keeping the the, the, the the rating from a bond point of view, which was very good. But from an sub- internal operational supply chain point of view, it put the system under stress quite quite uh, tremendously. And that meant that service was again at, at a problem in some area, some geography, which then meant that we had to reverse back and put more inventory. So again, you, you hear me talking about those swings, and uh, you cannot just focus on inventory alone uh, because soon you're going to cross the boundary of service and your customer are going to be very unhappy. But then again, putting more inventory does not always, you know, uh, is it never a guarantee for improved service either. So, Philippe, when you look at these slides, is there anything that surprises you? Um, well, I, I think, like like you mentioned, I think uh, when you step back, uh, although each and every one of us has been talking about best practice, is the fact is that the best practice, as you define it in your chart, is fairly elusive. And, and to get to those best practice, you need a, an extremely uh, optimal combination over a fairly long amount of time of um, what I would say two axes for me is, is one which is really – you know, your your linkage of the business strategy proactively with your supply chain strategy. And I, I mentioned the case of uh, Moody rating and, and acquisition, et cetera. You, you need to be able to understand uh, clearly what the business strategy is and from there being able to define with clarity the supply chain implications, good or bad. And uh, the fact as we said, that you cannot change everything at the same time. The second axis, I would say, in addition to uh, companies that I've seen that have been able to move toward best practice, I've also had, I would say, a supply chain seat at the table. Um, And what I mean by that is you need to be there at the table when the business leaders are defining the strategy so that you can ask some time for increased investment in some case, you know, a, a, a proactive uh, plan on, on cash flow as opposed to do the cash flow like it's still done in many, many companies after the facts when the costs have been established. Uh, and that the, 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 the seat at the table allows supply chain as a whole end-to-end to have a voice and to, to therefore also to be able to put the right talent at the right place uh, with the right pipeline of talent and the right depths. Those two elements, when you step back, you don't have a lot of companies that actually are able to do them. Usually people or CEO go for a quick win. Like, you know, everybody always agreed to improve payables um, because it's, it's a supplier that bear the, the, the brunt of the pressure. So that's an easy one, quote unquote, and it needs to be done, but it's much more difficult to manage and improve inventory in the long term. And that's what surprises me when, when you see it's not obviously as easy as it seems. And obviously there is a lot of reason and pressure to, to not, not to be there, but, but still uh, I was surprised by the lack of overall progress. You know, and I was too, Philippe, when I wrote the book. You know, when I first started putting the pen to paper on Bricks Matter, I really believed we had reduced inventory, and I would see great improvement. And I believe that we had improved customer service. But what I really found was we had increased complexity and that there was that gap between business strategy and process around what was really happening at the policy level and the translation of that policy level to strategy. And I was really shocked by that. You know, I've been in supply chain for a long time, uh, and I think a lot of other leaders are as well. So, you know, when we were rehearsing this, you know, you were telling me some things that you had learned. So if there's somebody out there that's grappling with the same issues, Philippe, what would you tell them? Well, again, I, I think it's about uh, we we need to learn from one another way more than what we do. Um, when um, I moved from um, consumer good to pharma, um, everybody always thinks they know the best practice, uh, but intellectually everybody looks at what's being the same. And 
pharma, there are good and bad. We talked about BMS. Uh, but the reality, there is no real leader in supply chain in pharma. But when you start to compare them, they pretty much all look alike. They're pretty much in plus minus five years in terms of uh, process and capability. Uh, the same thing uh, happens to be with food or consumer goods, but you, you also have a very different capabilities. And it's not a question about um, intelligence or means, but it's a question of what the business strategy asks you to do. And what I learn more and more is as you go around, there is always somebody that has done something that you can learn from. And, and in all my career, I would, I would really engage people to stop saying, yeah, but we're different. You know, I speak with many companies, and I hear very often, right or wrong, we are different. And, and very often, yes, the, 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 the choice that some companies are making are different. You know, some are top line, some are more, depending where they are, innovation uh, focused on, on speed and some on, on, uh, on reliability, what have you. But uh, everybody can always learn, and, and at some point, somebody out there has done it. And, you know, your, your excellent studies show, actually, that it's been done, and actually sometime – it's not about looking to go to frontier we've never been to, because in some case we have done it. We just need to go back where we used to be in, in some case and what worked and what has changed. An example that we discussed together, Laura, was, you know, we've been talking about global and a global industry for a long while. I, I think now it's sinking in what global really means in its all shape. It doesn't mean go from one country and replicate exactly the same thing. The world is extremely complex out there. And, and the last 10 to 15 years have shown that to drive growth from emerging markets, it is not about replicating what worked in the UK or France or the US only, but it's, it's dealing with a huge amount of complexity. And if anything, what you can see in pharma, pharma is actually a, a global industry that used to be with a two pillar, mostly Europe and, and, and the US. And for chasing growth is actually now expanding rapidly in emerging markets. But to do that needs to face all the local um, environment. So pharma is actually going from being very global to being very local. And an example of that, Merck at this moment has 100,000 regulatory changes uh, with about 160 countries. Because when you change a product anywhere in a plant, you need to get regular approval, regulatory approval from every country you sell in. And the reverse, the food has been much more, you know, was very local and has had to learn to be global, like the notion of global brands. Um, you know, Maybelline, uh, for example, in L'Oreal is sell, sold in many, many countries and it's launched simultaneously across the world, but that drives a lot more complexity. So if anything is, I would say, number one is think about, you know, who is doing it out there and, and eliminate the, the fact that you're different and, and open your mind. And number two, understand what the, the key structural external driver that are really driving change and, and complexity. I don't think we're worse than we used to be, but the pressure, external pressure, are so much more intense than it used to be 20 years ago. It has put a lot of pressure on our supply chains. Now, Philippe, what do you mean by eliminate the white noise? You know, as a leader, you know, you talked about a seat at the table and the long-term perspective. What did you mean by eliminate the white noise? Well, I, I think it, it's sometimes, you know, you mention a bit like the flavor of the month. Very often, mm -hmm. company will tell you, okay, now I want lower inventory. I want improved service. Very often, as a leader, when I look back about what worked and what didn't work, th there is a sense of... Uh, you know, noise that is always there that actually overwhelm what actually matters. And when you step back, and it's true for implementing and getting benefits of your SAP system, getting the basics in your MRP, um, the, the companies that have stuck to the basics and, and, and have literally uh, continued to invest in enabler and prerequisites uh, have been best able to pick and choose on the key uh, supply chain characteristic that truly matter uh, 
to have fully enabled the, the, the business strategy. And I think I'd go back to my first point about the, the linkage between the supply chain and, and the business strategy. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes there is a, a, a lot of movement where we as supply chain leader, we, we like to be seen as we're all very action oriented, but sometimes you know, we, we confuse activity for progress. And, and if anything, you know, eliminating the white noise for me for is let's do things in, in a better sequence with a better strategic planning as opposed to try to do everything at the same time and, and, and having to go back to square one every three years. The other thing when I was interviewing you before, Philippe, when you were talking about understanding the potential and that lots of times people ask you to do things and you absorb it and you go on and you don't help them to understand the potential and you talked about some things that happened in your career in that area. You know, what advice would you have there for supply chain leaders? Uh, what do you mean in terms, can you precise your question, Laura, in terms of uh, Understanding or? the potential of the trade-offs of how do you, you got the seat at the table right. and you're know, focused. Uh, how do you help uh, the other people at the table to understand the trade-offs of you make certain decisions in business like you're going to go DSP or you're going right. to make those changes in inventory and, you know, really looking at the impact of the system and potential? Right. What, what I've seen is what works is being very simple at explaining things like they are. And, and it, it also means you're not always very popular. But very often where I made mistakes was to say, I'm going to try it anyway. I know it's going to be impossible, but I'm going to try and take up the hill. And, and very often what that does is that leads to a very stressed organization that, doesn't, that is uh, backed up against the wall. So if anything, when things work, is to say, you know, when you have business meeting, when you have people articulating strategy, to say this is what it will mean. Do you agree? And getting a partnership with the business leader to say, look, I can do this, but I cannot do that. Or in order for you to do what you want to do, I'm going to need those three things, and you need to be very clear up front very early on. Uh, as I said, you know, I've never seen any business leader that says I want more inventory. Uh, everybody mm-hmm. always wants to reduce inventory. But the discussion always have in sequence – you first look at your cost and your margin, and then someday, once you've put the numbers together, I've seen so many times, people then look at the cash flow and inventory. And the reality is, once you've, you do that in that sequence, you're locked in. And, and so very often, what you need to do is to have, a, again, like you said, a holistic approach saying, okay, that means that if you go for cost, I'm going to have to do this. That means I'm going to be less flexible. That means if you start to triple your amount of promotion and you want me to cut the cost by 20%, we're going to hit the wall. Those discussions at the high level need to be, you need to educate the business leader. And again, where really where things have been working in my career is where I've been able to create that linkage, that aha moment where the business leader realizes he or she cannot ask for everything. And, and you tell them which framework they have to operate on so that they are an ideal business partner with you. At the reverse, you know, you know you, yep. when, when, when you are at the tail end, you, you're just a victim. Yeah. And I find that the use of some of the new network design tools are very helpful for that, uh, and that people that are doing more modeling are able to visualize and help people to understand the complexities. But, you know, I have a question from a panel member. Uh, It says that, okay, Philippe, risk has a lot of dimensions now, right? Uh, Do you see that you've got more volatility when you're sitting at the table with price or weather or what's happening in the world? I mean, is it a more volatile period to have the seat at the table and manage these discussions? I mean, yeah, it's it's certainly more risky, right? I mean, it, it's again, I think it, it's it's more difficult than it used to be, uh, but but I think it's it's so much more important. Um, mm-hmm. And once you've gone through that type of education, what you will have is your CEO or your business leader will turn to you and will ask you, "What do you think?" And and once you 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 you've solved the first couple of crises. 
again, it's not about being the person that can, you know, as a as a white shiny uh, um, knight, being able to solve everything. Is is just to say to be proactive and saying this is how things. W- w- that's where we need to watch out. Then you talked about a network. A good a good discussion very often, which is difficult to have, is. Many of us, again, I've never seen a business leader that wants more plant and wants more cap- less capacity utilization. So the discussion is always you're going to have to close plant to save money and increase capacity. But at the time, you know, very often capacity utilization from a, a company point of view means actually I want to use my assets better, which is fine. When you do that across the board in an environment where you actually need flexibility, you're going to get in trouble. And, and I think it's having those discussions. An example that I've lived through when I was at Kraft was in Kraft is, is still in coffee. Uh, and coffee, you have two types of businesses. You have the soluble coffee, which is a huge investment, uh, which is basically a chemical plant. And you have a roast and ground coffee. Roast and ground coffee has a lot of promotion and has a low investment. So what you can do is actually have a supply chain which has a low utilization fairly cheaply and can have a, a, very, a very nice firepower. Whereas soluble, to get to a lower cost, you need to run the factory all the time. You need to explain those type of discussion because sometimes you cannot have both. You cannot have a supply chain that can be both responsive and cheap. And that, that's finding that, that sweet spot that your business understands is, is critical to be successful in supply chain, I found. Yeah, you know, the most efficient supply chain isn't always the most effective, right? Right, exactly. So any, any last minute advice for the leader? Uh, if you had to say one thing from your two experiences, what would you tell them? Um, step back. Uh, what that means by that is, is very often we're all caught in the in the moment, and and it's about being able as leader to relay the course. I mean, what what you've you've shown in your uh, outlook there, it's it's really about some of the things can be predictive, can be explained, and so as as you mature and you're more senior in your your uh, company, is be able to have the right discussion and show what's at stake in, in, a, in a more long-term manner and, and, and use uh, what, what the business wants in terms of, of, um, of uh, targets and achievement to link better supply chain strategy with business strategy. Thank you so much, Philippe. I, you know, I think that you know, my lesson is that we kind of got lulled to sleep believing we had best practices without really thinking about supply chain strategy and I see so many people say the words but not really understand it and not really understand the potential of the supply chain for their own trade-offs or even look at what they've actually done. So often when I bring these kind of charts into an organization, they look at them and they go, wow, where'd you get that data? And I say, well, off your financial balance sheets and income statements. They're like, wow, that's such a different way of looking at it. But, you know, if you think back to the statement of supply chain leaders have very tight patterns year over year with conscious trade-offs, and they also have balance. We're going to be talking about this more at our global summit where we're actually going to be talking about the results that we've done on the supply chain index and the correlation to market capitalization and why balance and trade-offs matter. We're going to be live streaming from the event, so you'll see Philippe talk more and actually respond to audience questions about the patterns at both Kraft and at Merck and uh, also on supply chain leadership. We also have a number of panels on talent. There's a six to one demand to the supply for talent. And we're going to be talking about imagine the supply chain if we had 3D printing and 3D cell generation and the ability to have big data that can answer the questions we don't know to ask and give us visualization of the patterns that we don't see today and the ability to really look at social and be able to integrate it into new channels. And so the people that are attending our summit are going to have a real 
chance to look at the progress that we've made and then to talk about building talent to really be able to go after what we call the race for supply chain 2020 to imagine the supply chain as it could be. We also are continuing corporate training, and so if you're interested in having some of your supply chain leaders join us for training, we have two training events. And we will continue to keep up the webinar series. Uh, we do these monthly, and so we have a post-global summit recap where we have research and we also have the insights from the data mining we've done on results, and we have a a visual facilitator that will actually be drawing the insights from supply chain leaders into a graphical representation that we'll be presenting on September 26th. On October 10th, we'll continue the work on the discussions on metrics that matter with another supply chain leader to talk about his story. And then on November 14th, we're going to be talking about the healthcare value chain, and we're going to actually be zeroing in on some of the insights on how does innovation change value analysis and take out the waste out of the supply chain because, you know, as you'll hear at our global summit, pressure's on and it's too intense for health care leaders to stop and wait. And of course, our past webinars are available on demand on our website if you would like to hear them. And we also have the opportunity for custom financial benchmarking if you're interested in looking at studies in a similar way as you get ready for year 2014 supply chain strategy. Check this out and we will help you with charts that look very similar. And of course, follow us on our blogs and uh, our research is in front of the firewall. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful Labor Day if you're in North America and in other parts of the world. We'll see you soon. This is Supply Chain Insights, our monthly webinar. Constance? Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Philippe, for participating in today's Supply Chain Insights webinar. Uh, as Laura mentioned, Philippe will be a guest speaker at our Supply Chain Insights Global Summit September 11th and 12th in Scottsdale, Arizona. We still have a few slots available for the full agenda and to register, visit our website, supplychaininsightsglobalsummit.com. Thank you for attending today. See you next time on the Supply Chain Insights webinar series. Have a great day.